Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Past guests include Kevin King, Michael E. Gerber, author of The E-Myth, and Howard Tai. Today, I'm speaking with Michael Marr, the owner and visionary for Cartology, a custom done-for-you services agency that provides full-spectrum management for brands on Amazon. And we're going to be talking a lot about the experience he has in seeing what is actually working today to help scale brands on Amazon. And we're going to dive into those specific strategies. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting where I help seven-figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Michael, I started my business back in 2015, and I grew it to an eight-figure brand in seven years. But I made a lot of mistakes along the way that made the path of getting to eight figures take a lot longer than it needed to. There were times where I had self-doubt in myself as a leader, where I, whether I could actually run and lead a team of people, or whether my business could actually survive on the Amazon marketplace, or if we would have the cash flow to be able to purchase new products in order to continue to grow. I wish I would have had a guide along the way that would have made getting there a lot quicker and easier to help me navigate around those stumbling blocks I ran into. So to our listeners, those of you who are running into similar obstacles or you're hitting plateaus and you want to know the next steps to take your brand to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com to learn more. That's ecom with two M's. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. All you need to do is email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com and in your subject line say strategy audit and then plead your case as to why I should choose you and your business to work with this month. Before introducing today's guest, I want to give a big thank you to Nathan Hirsch and thank him for referring Michael as a guest for the podcast. Nathan Hirsch is the CEO of Ecom Balance, an online bookkeeping service for e-commerce and digital businesses, as well as Outsource School is a membership teaching business owners how to hire effectively online. Today, I'm excited to introduce you all to Michael Marr. Michael is the owner and visionary of Cartology, a custom done for you services agency that provides full spectrum management for brands on Amazon from catalog optimization to advertising, to international expansion, Cartology takes your brand story and translates it into an elevated brand awareness, revenue, and profitability on the Amazon marketplace. They help Amazon business owners play the long game, developing strategies that are custom tailored for your unique goals so that you thrive. He is also the host of the Longer Game podcast, and his podcast is about the future of retail. With that introduction, welcome to the show, Michael. The power of a good copywriter, man. We're <laughs> totally worth the money. Thanks for having me, man. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, honored that Nathan recommended me. I've known him for a while, and I'm happy to, to get into it and talk about, talk about Amazon, talk about growing a, growing a business. It's, uh, it's tough out there, man. You, you mentioned you know, running into a lot of mistakes or making a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, it probably helped you, enabled you to... to help the consulting clients that you're dealing with now even more so because you, you've run into that stuff. So you've experienced it and you can, you can feel that, that pain, but man, it's yep. great to have someone to help you avoid that stuff if you can. It's true. Yeah. Sometimes it, it is good, right? So going through those obstacles and challenges provides you with a lot of learning opportunities. But again, I'm, I'm definitely a big believer that, you know, if you just have a mentor or guide, it, you know, they can help you, you know, scale faster help you overcome just easy stumbling blocks that you honestly don't even need to encounter if you just had somebody helping you know what was around the next corner, right? Or, or um, even just get through it quicker. Like you, yeah. a lot of the stuff that you're going to come up against, everyone's going to face some of the similar things. But if instead of, you know, taking three different approaches and realizing, okay, this one works, if you've got a great, I'm a, I'm a big um, believer in coaches or trainers or consultants, 
Um, I, I kind of had a problem with that word coach. Uh, maybe it's just because I, I didn't grow up doing sports. I was in band. I was doing all music stuff. So that didn't really resonate with me. But like having a good coach is someone who can instruct and guide you. And I think that's a, you look at any professional at any level, they've got multiple coaches oh. that are helping and, and, and guide them from like a, an athletic coach. If you're in sports to, to a, a mindset coach, uh, Jim Lohr is a, has, he's read a, written a couple of books um, but talked about, you know, change in mindset and how he worked with different like Olympic athletes that were blocked. And as soon as they freed up that mental space and they got past the self-doubt, they were able to really excel. And that's something that they probably would not have been able to do on their own because they were so inside their own head. So I'm I'm a big believer in that. I'm sure you're you're helping a lot of people. Well, I appreciate those kind words, Michael. Now, Michael, I'm excited to dive into your story. Um, you know, before we dive into all of the amazing, you know, case studies that we'll dive into with how you've worked with clients there with Cartology, I'm interested to hear in your journey, what led you to, you know, gaining the experience you needed to in order to create Cartology and to be able to say like, yeah, we know the Amazon game and we know how to help scale brands and help them grow and take things to the next level. So uh, why don't you give us a little bit of your journey and what got you to where you are today? Well, like you, Josh, I also ran into a lot of obstacles and learned stuff the hard way. And my story started back in 2010. I hated my job, man. I mean, it's, it's that simple. The job I was working at the time was just not fun. I, I was managing this. Um, I was managing a, a coffee shop for Starbucks and I, I had graduated school. I was like, I don't know what I want to do. And so I just kind of worked my way up there. And after I'd been there for about a year, I was like, this sucks. I hate this. I had pressure for my uh, boss. I had a supportive district manager before, but then she left and this new one came in and she was trying to either get you to be her puppet or she was, she was firing you. Um, so it, it, anytime I gave feedback, like, Hey, this isn't working. This isn't good. It was like, you're being negative. And I was like, <laughs> I'm trying to improve something. I, I I'm here doing the work. I'm, I'm showing up. So it just felt like, uh, you know, I wasn't appreciated and the pay wasn't that, you know, great if I'm honest anyway. So I had experience selling music gear on eBay. I am a musician and I would uh, go and buy maybe like an old drum machine or synthesizer and would go to like a pawn shop and there would be something there. I'm like, Oh, I'd go look it up on eBay. They have no idea what they're, and this is before reverb, anything like that. Okay. They had no idea what they were, what they were selling. They weren't a lot of pawn shops are selling now on, on marketplaces like a reverb or, or eBay, but I would go and see, okay, I could sell this for way more. Look up completed items, had a buddy that I would do that with. and knowing that I had that skill set, I had another friend who had started, I mean, really just buying generic goods, reselling stuff on eBay and then Amazon. And I was like, dude, you got to show me what you're doing. I, I need to get out. I need to do something. So he walked me through the, the business side of things and much smarter guy, I think, than I. He was an accountant. So really understood some of the financial stuff. He was like trying to explain what a balance sheet was to me. And I was like, why would you put something in over here and take it out over here? Leave uh -huh. it in the business. Like just, just no clue that was, I didn't go to school for business. That was not my, that was not my forte. So he walked me through that process. I took a couple grand to Vegas with me. We talked about Vegas earlier, but yeah. I went to the ASD show. I invested a couple grand in some inventory. Uh, at the time there was a research software called Terapeak for eBay. I don't even know if it's, if it's still around, but I would go uh, walk the floor. And at that time people did not want you selling their products on Amazon or, or online. They were avoiding that like the plague. They thought it was bad. And now from what I hear, you go to those shows, people are dying for you to like, oh, please, you know, let's do this. Help us, help us grow. Because they realize how, I mean, so many times have changed uh, in the past 13 years. But I uh, invested a couple, couple grand in some product and worked that for about a year, just eBay alone. And, you know, had a conversation with my wife and was like, at what point, you know, do I leave my job? When it, when is it, a good idea. And I was like, okay, well, if you can prove an, enough income and you can actually take a paycheck then, and, you know, replace what you're doing, then that would be, that would be a good place to start. And so after about a year, I was able to and take a paycheck and I was like, all right, I'm, I'm getting out of here. As soon as I left, I, I launched on Amazon and man, it was a uh, quite the learning experience from the very beginning. I remember, you know, selling something and I didn't ship it right away. And I'm pretty sure Amazon like almost immediately suspended me. And I was like, what's going on? And my buddy was like, dude, you can't mess around. You have to be really on top of it. And I was like, okay. So 
you know, learned, grew in, in, in that space, started, I mean, before even private label was a thing, starting a sort of like a private label business over time, over the course of six years, as I had that business, I eventually developed a brand. It was like a health and fitness brand. And we had this gym timer. It was like a, an interval timer, something that maybe like a CrossFit or an MMA or something like that gym would, would buy. And uh, that was a really great seller for us. Just happened to find a good supplier and was able to, you know, sell it, mark it up, but had a really good, even like extended warranty. Like, Hey, you have a problem in the next year. We'll, uh, we'll you know, we'll refund you in full or we'll, we'll replace the item for you. Just experienced a lot of stuff that there wasn't a ton of regulation on or a lot of notifications on. Like there's so many different sources now to say, Hey, what happens when I lose the buy box? What does that mean? And there was, a, there was not a lot of that information. So just kind of figuring out as you go, running into a lot of the issues that people still experience today, someone leaving a negative review and it's not accurate. Like I was selling iPhone three cases and someone was like, this doesn't fit my iPhone four. And I was like, yeah, of course it doesn't. It's the, <laughs> it's the wrong kind of case. And so, uh, you know, Amazon's like, we're not going to take that down because we, we think it's valid feedback. And I was like, okay, well that's stupid, but you know, there's not a whole lot I can do about that. So j- just a lot of hard knocks, but also I had my friend that I could reach out to like, Hey, what are you seeing? He's still a very successful seller, continued to grow, um, and has expanded his product lines and, and business. And so I've been, you know, happy to, to, to see him grow back in 2015 though, Amazon opened up the marketplace to China. And so they were right around that time, like 2015, 2016, a ton of Chinese manufacturers started selling direct to the consumer mm-hmm. and they came in and sold my product basically at my cost. And I had a couple products that were really driving sales. Uh, there's a lot of things in hindsight that I'm like, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done this. But it, when it came down to it, they came in, basically usurped a ton of my sales. And I did not have the cash flow to, to support that, to say, okay, well, I can continue to either not pay myself um, or bleed money. It just was not an option. And there were a lot of uh, financial mistakes that I made along the way that you know I didn't have like a savings. I didn't have stuff that you know, I think you, you really need to survive and thrive in those hard times because there absolutely will be those difficult times in business. And I, so I on eventually... that note, before, sorry to interrupt you here, oh, but you're I'm fine. curious to hear like, what are those mistakes that you feel like in hindsight, you're like, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. Because I feel like learning from the mistakes are some of the most valuable things that we can take away as listeners to your story. One of the biggest things was the product itself and, and consumer experience. So people would leave a negative review of something and I would chalk it up to user error. Okay. Well, it could be user error, but what are you doing to fix and solve that? Initially, I, I didn't, this is going to sound crazy, but initially I didn't want to embrace FBA because I felt like Amazon just wanted more money. Of course, everybody knows that the prime members are the ones that are most active. They convert at the highest rate. So it's really important to, to lean into that, you know, if it makes sense from a financial standpoint. So that, that was one thing, but also just the product experience. Like I said, someone leave a negative review. Oh, well, you know, they, it, it was their bad. They, they had a, a problem and they just, they were dumb. They didn't know what they were doing. And that burned me because the review started to, to go south. And if someone's coming with a cheaper product and your product is, doesn't have a good, you know, star rating, um, the biggest conversion rate drop I see is from a decrease in star rating, not, um, or, or even an increase. It's not review number per se. Uh, so that was a big, mistake on my part. And one of the things that all these mistakes have helped me with, with clients. So one of the things that we talk about with clients now is, Hey, we're seeing a lot of this error or this problem and negative reviews come up. This is something you're going to want to talk to your manufacturer about. We want to get ahead of this because if it starts to decline to a certain point, product's not going to have the conversion rate needs to, you're going to have a much higher customer acquisition cost. Uh, So that was one of the biggest mistakes I made. I think the other thing was I was really hungry to get sales. And so, you know, I didn't want to take a listing down or, um, I didn't manage, you know, stock really well, uh, on certain things. And so having your, um, eyes dotted and your T's crossed in that sense, I mean, that's kind of like a basic thing now, but uh, there were just things that I, I was not as, uh, not as, as good at. Um, and then I think the other thing is just relying too heavily on a couple of items for sales. That's a really dangerous place to be in because listing gets suppressed. I mean, if you're like a consumer goods company and you've got one product in different flavors or scents and that's your product, I get that. But if you don't really have a ton of IP behind something and by IP, I don't just mean product like your brand, 
But if you don't have anything that's that's backing that up, you need to eventually expand your product line. And and I was predominantly a, a reseller, but I had some of my own branded items. And I was really heavily reliant upon a couple of things. So no, you know, now there's a lot of differences in optimization. Then it was like try and get something as close to on a white background as possible, maybe edit it in a software and then launch on an Amazon. There was no, there was not lifestyle. There was not all this, uh, you know, additional components. Um, but I, I think those are the, no. the big ones. Like the consumer, I don't think, you know, the customer is always right, but if they're having a negative experience, you have to address that or else, you know, people will have a negative perception of your, of your product. That was a, that was a really big one. Yeah. I think one really important thing that you talked about there I think the game has changed on Amazon. Everybody talked about like, oh, the number of reviews are so, so important. I honestly think the number of reviews, frankly, don't matter. I think you cross 20 reviews and that you might as well have 5,000 reviews. The customer is going to view them almost the same. But the big thing is if you are at a 3.7, right, and you ha- that shows up as a 3.5 star rating, um, that's a huge difference compared to going to 3.8, which gets you at least to a four star rating. But it, so any of those like incremental adjustments to go from a four star to a four and a half star like that, you will see a huge like change in your conversion rate. And so I think that's a super important thing to call out. Um, I know I interrupted you in your flow. You're oh, working up to, you know, how you got into cartology then, right? It's it's a really... um when things kind of crashed and burned in 2016, and I think this is a super relatable story for any entrepreneur out there, because there's a lot of sexy, big, you know, big sales. Like, you know, we're talking about helping brands get from seven to eight figures, uh, and that's the sexy version of it. But in order to get there, there's a lot of unsexy work, work in operations, work on a financial. There's a lot of stuff that has to be done um, to get there, and so. Um, during that time period, I just had a lot of shame because I felt like I had failed. And I mean, I get, I kind of had it in a way, um, but it, it was a, there was a very big shift in my story, meaning my, my life. And I just had this, you know, I talked about my friend who's a successful seller still, and I had this vision that that's what my life was going to be like. And it was in that year that I had a better understanding of where I was going to go. My faith was galvanized. I, I really felt like there was a different purpose for me. And God was saying, okay, like we're going to use this negative circumstance and turn it into something uh, that's eventually going to be positive, but you got to trust me during this, this time period. So in that time period, I had to unwind this, this product-based business. I knew I had to get, you know, do something with this skill set. I also had to get a full-time job because my wife and I are two income family. Um, I ended up, during that time period, I went back and started managing a coffee shop because it was a very quick available job that I could get. Uh, and I actually had nightmares that I was, you know, that I'd <laughs> failed and I was back working in a coffee shop. So lo and behold, I end up doing that as I'm like, how do I unwind this business and how do I utilize the skill set that I've acquired? I didn't die though. So I was, I was still alive. And it was in that time period that I had realized, okay, I had, I had a skill set. I had done some couple of like, consulting or freelance type things because uh, people had requested like, Hey, can you help? And like, you know, you're a doer and then people want to know how do you do? And so that's, I think, you know, how, how the consulting and stuff starts. Uh, and it was in that time period, I just started to pick up these additional projects as I was working this full-time job, as I was unwinding this business. I mean, it was a super stressful time, but I really quickly realized one, I loved the Amazon side of things because I was on multiple channels, eBay, Amazon. Um, I did sell on Etsy for a little bit. I had my own website. I uh, sold on Sears Marketplace for a while. Uh-huh. Uh, I think it's still out there, but it's uh, it was pretty it's pretty terrible. Um, definitely some interesting stories uh, with with that marketplace. But I very quickly realized I love the Amazon side of things. I love the um, strategy, but also execution and like advertising and optimizing things. I really enjoyed that, and so I I, I you know within, over the period of let's say six months, really started to lean into that. Um, that's actually when I met Nathan, I started taking on uh, freelance projects through FreeUp um, at the time, you know, which he had, he had started uh, with Connor uh, that they eventually exited from and just started to build up this momentum, you know, only had to work that job for under a year. So I was thankful when I got to that other full-time job. So I was thankful when I got to leave that, um, but had, had built up this 
client base and was now able to take on products on my own outside of FreeUp. I was able to um, just kind of figure things out. And and within even just that first couple of months, I was like, man, there's such a demand for this work. I'm going to have to hire additional people to help me. And I'd already been creating SOPs in my business, not to the extent that I have today, but I'd already created like, here's how you ship something out. Here's how you handle customer service. Like I did that for mm-hmm. people that that worked for me in my in my econ business. And so just started doing that with people and taking on more products and work. And it's slowly grown into what it is now. And and really cartology over the past three years, it kind of how I see it is there's really been a specific target that we're going after. We've gotten really clear on that, really honed in on the team. What are the things that we do well? What are we staying away from? Uh, and even more recently in the past year, really fine t- fine tuning operations. I read the book Traction um, and felt like implementing EOS was going to be a game changer. And it's it's been super helpful just because we've been very clear about like you know what what are things we what are issues that are plaguing us that we need to address that we need to fix so that as we scale and grow we can actually be successful. Um, so the the past three years have been super pivotal, but it took a couple of years to figure out what do I do best? Is it is it just this one specific thing? Is it full you know channel management? Um, and and all the things that I encountered, like ton of Chinese competition that, I mean, I have very, I, I don't think it's often that you necessarily get a reference back to a specific issue that you face that you get to help someone with. But I had a client who met him at like an Amazon meetup group and he's like, Hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling. My sales have dropped almost overnight. And in January, I think his sales were like 120,000 and by February or by March, they were 25,000 for the month. So wow. it was a huge drop off. Yeah. I came in and was like, saw a ton of Chinese competition that had come in. All his sales were organic. This was in like 2017, 2018. There was no advertising. Um, we, we flipped that on and optimized his listings. And if you look at what he spent in advertising, that's essentially the revenue that he added on. So he would have been out of business and we were able to basically have him be even from, from the previous year. So sales look like an increase, but his cost in advertising increased that same amount, but that was a huge win. And had I not experienced that, I don't know that I would have myself, I don't know that I would have been able to necessarily diagnose it. So, I mean, that was a, a, a huge win. And that was an example of, you know, one of those failures or learning experiences, mistakes, whatever you want to call it, that I was able to, to, to label later turn into something that helped someone else. So that, that was a cool feeling. And it made, made feel like going through that, that process a little bit. I'm like, Oh, okay. I get it now. Like I can see why, you know, that that's tough circumstance was, was in the road for me. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. Um, you know, story about your journey that it hasn't just been sunshine and rainbows. That's like, I started in 2010 and I just continued to crush it. I love that, you know, um, you know, God had different paths for you to go through in order to get to where you are today. And that you see all of that as, you know, building blocks to get you to kind of in your flow state where you are today. And even with cartology, you've gone through iterations and honing in on like who it is that you serve. So I would love to try to be, I just want to say, I try to be honest about that because I think there's a lot of people who do experience that. And I know it, it could put me in a vulnerable place like, oh, well, you know, you, you failed in this, in this instance, doesn't that, you know, aren't you worried about perception? And I'm like, no, I mean, I, I initially, I told you I initially was, I felt a lot of shame, yeah. uh, but as I worked through that, I was like, okay, like it was just a tough experience. Many entrepreneurs go through those tough experiences. And I think if we talk about that more, there's hopefully a little bit more, like you still have to get it right. You still have to, you know, get results. If, if you're serving people, you still have to get results. You have to get results in your business, but yeah, I mean, I, I want to be honest and upfront about that because there is a lot of the sexy talk about stuff and there's just a lot of unsexy stuff that's uh, part of it. I think actually Nathan is, uh, Hirsch uh, has said he wants to be the unsexy entrepreneur. And I mean, that's kind of the stuff that, that makes things, that make things, I think, work really well and makes the sexy stuff even sexier is, hey, I've got good operations. I'm coaching people on my yep. team, like all this stuff that you need to do to really yep. be successful. Yeah. And I think that vulnerability is so, so crucial um, because all of us, we, we all go through our own obstacles and challenges to get to where we are today. Um, and also knowing that, you know, you only fail when you quit and you just throw in the towel um, mm. because outside of that, it should be seen as a 
obs- like an obstacle that you had to overcome. But once you step up and over overcome that obstacle, now you can look back from that mountain peak and kind of see the vistas of, wow, look at what I've been able to accomplish. Had I given up, I wouldn't be able to see the view that I see now. So I think that's super important. So, Michael, I would love to dive into some of the specific strategies and action items um, and case studies that we talked about before we hit the record button of brands that have come to you. Tell us about, you know, give us the examples and case studies for each of the brands. What were they struggling with? What were the strategies that you implemented with them? And what type of success did they see once they were able to implement some of these things? There was a brand that came to us January of 2020. Uh, so it was a very interesting time because we were managing them right when, when you know, the pandemic started. And there are, I think, some not all information about Amazon's created equal. I think you you probably know that Josh had been in the space for a while. So you've seen some people that are just selling their brand or course, whatever the case might be. And I think there's there's validity in some of those things, but you know, we don't really know what success rate of, of people that have maybe done specific courses are. And so it's hard to know. And, and that could be, you know, someone not implementing it right as well, too. But not all information is created equal. And so we had someone that came to us. They were live on Amazon. They did. They had launched maybe six months ago. Great, great brand. Great brand story. And that's really been where we've you know focused now as an agency is focusing on brands that have clear target audience. They they've got a, a story. They've got um, when I talk about IP, you know, I don't just mean oh we've got this specific unique flavor or design, but like IP in your brand, who that is, because that's one of the emotional connections you can make with people. So I remember talking with them. And just, you know, kind of auditing their account. And one of the biggest things I saw was there was just a ton of ad spent. And I'm a proponent for spending more on advertising. You have to know what you're spending towards. And the goal should always be higher placement in search. Now, you may not be higher in the most generic term. Like if you sell toothpaste, you may not be number one in the toothpaste spot, but maybe you're an organic toothpaste or maybe you're. Uh, an organic fluoride free toothpaste. Like there are additional places that you can rank. But the reason I say top of search is because 70 plus percent of people don't go past page one. And so if you're not visible there, it's really hard to get the sales that you need to to keep your, your momentum going. And they were spending a ton on ads with a different service provider and really, really low return like spending six figures in ads and like, you know, 0.3 return on, on the ad spend. And the problem was they were, the, the previous company was treating this ad spend like it was almost like it was display or awareness. Like it's like they were using the search console, but trying to spend and, and, and manage it like it was DSP. It was, it was a very interesting. Uh, yeah, it was like just top of funnel keywords. That was it. And they were getting a little return. And they, they were not a well-known brand. It was a competitive uh, space in personal care. And so I was like, you know, and, and then just diving deeper into that ad spend. Like they had pretty, they had like good assets. There were some refining of some of those assets. They had very strict control over like creative and stuff. And so there was some stuff that we could do, but there was like optimization, uh, optimization of like the SEO side of things. Um, but the advertising pivot was a big one. And we were continuing to spend a large amount. But when the pandemic hit in March, they wanted to pull all ad spend. And I I was pretty sure I remember what I said, but I actually went back recently and looked through emails and was like, okay, what did I what did I recommend to them? And we said, don't pull all your ad spend. Everyone else is going to do that. You're and you're ultimately you're going to lose momentum. So you need to keep spending. We want to continue to build on what we've gotten. And they pulled back a lot on ad spend, but we got them to to keep spending. And during that time period, we were uh, we initially saw an increase in CPC because we were being very specific about targets that we we're going after, and there were some things we wanted to rank on. But the big I was the one that did the the initial like you know refiguring of the the ad campaigns. It took me a good week of like almost full days to like revamp this thing because I wanted to preserve some of that past experience. Yeah. That that Amazon had or past you know history in those campaigns because some of the things had performance and I wanted to leverage that but there was some stuff that needed to be totally redone and and transformed and one of the other big issues that I saw was 
and I see this a lot with any brand that I'm auditing, just stuffing a ton of targets into a campaign. And I get why people would want to do that. I think the logic is all these irrelevant keywords. So I want Amazon to spend on, you know, whatever keywords I put in here. The problem with that, I don't think you have to get it down to single keyword isolation. I think there could be a use case for that. But when you stuff all those targets in there, you're limited by your, your, your daily budget. And let's say you've got 100 terms. I mean, I've seen way more than that. But and, and don't get me wrong, when, adver- when I first started using advertising in like 2015, when it was opened up to me as a seller, I go back and I can look at some of those campaigns and it's like one word, broad match. I mean, just very, very yeah. basic stuff. The crazy part is though, it worked because it was not super competitive at the time. So I had a keyword, higher priced item, you know, really good uh, ACoS on, on those campaigns. What's interesting about back then is I saw my total sales increase and I was like, that's weird. I'm seeing this increase in sales, but it's not being like advertising's not showing up, like just kind of like a weird thought. And over time, we've seen these development of metrics like tacos, you could say true row as whatever the case might be, but um, your ad spend, there's a correlation between that and uh, your increase in, in total sales. Now, proving causation is a lot more difficult, um, but when we've analyzed data from our current clients uh, and clients we've worked with, uh, we've seen a very strong correlation between ad spend and just total sales Mm. increase. um, And it's very statistically significant, like 94% of the time when you spend ads, you're going to see an increase in in total sales. And there's other stuff to uncover there, but long story short, you know, when you spend on ads, you do see an increase in in total sales because it's all going back to that same listing. So it, it, whether it's an ad that gets the sale attributed to it or it's organic, it's all you know building on the the power, I guess you could say, of that that listing. So the, this client that we had, he pulled back ad spend, and we did see an increase in CPC, which I kind of expect because we're like, okay, we're going after these targets, we're going to put more spend on it, we're going to yeah. bid a little bit higher because we want to win the impressions, but we're confident that we're going to get the conversions, but we have to get impressions and clicks first. So we saw an increase in CPC. Then after a couple months, we actually saw a decrease in CPC as we continued to improve performance. And so mm. that was a big help for them. They came to us at maybe doing like 60, 70,000 a month in sales. And after a year, they, they wanted to take it in-house, which I, which I understood. I mean, I, I wanted to keep working with them, but they wanted to take it in-house. Um, and they left us doing it like about 215,000 a month. So uh, we, they had very aggressive goals, but we actually spent less initially. And by that, by the time they left, we were spending like half of what they were spending, you know, prior to coming on with us and they had grown significantly. So I think mm-hmm. one of the biggest takeaways for me from that is you have to spend on advertising, but it's got to be intentional yeah. and you have to stay the course. So many people want to pull out from ads because they're worried about the number or they're worried about the current return. And there's someone I saw recently who um, there, there's a, a, a devotional app that I read and I, but I know this guy who like does notes and he, and he talks about, um, for, he was talking about first order negative, second order positive thinking. It's like, okay, you know, what does that mean? And it's making a choice that might negatively impact you right now, but that's going to breed better results in the long term. And so a lot of people are first order positive, second order negative, like I'm going to buy this really cool sports car because I have hundred thousand dollars, but that's, and that's positive now, but the second order negative is, Oh, I don't have money for groceries or for my rent. Yeah. So I'm not really thinking this all the way through. And the, the, the case with advertising spend a lot of times is, Oh, I'm, I'm not seeing a good return. So I want to pull back right away. If you're confident in your product and you know that you, you have nailed the market in that sense. I mean, you won't really truly know until you spend and you start seeing sales come in. You have to spend even in the face of, a low ROAS or a high ACOS, however you want to look at it, because you have to build velocity and you have to prove yourself, not just with the consumer, but even with Amazon's advertising algorithm. So you have to start winning stuff. You have to start pushing forward. And that seems very counterintuitive. But when we started to spend more, we started to get the velocity that we needed and we started to earn sales. Why would Amazon want to show your product in advertising in the first place? They they want your money for sure. But where do they make the most money? It's not advertising. It's when your product sells. It's the actual marketplace itself. So Amazon, and and they want to be the most customer-centric company in the world. What's more customer-centric than putting the right product in front of the right person at the right time, keeping, you know, you taxing their infrastructure from a site level, 
down low. They get you on off site. You, you purchase quickly that frees you up. So that next time you go back, you're like, Oh, I was able to find this thing really quickly. I got, had a great experience and you keep coming back. And hence the, the power of prime is, uh, is born. So really, really focusing on, you know, where you want to direct spend. I had talked about, you know, having a hundred targets inside of a campaign and I didn't finish that thought, but when you have a hundred targets inside of a campaign, Let's say you have a dollar CPC. You could be lucky these days to have a dollar CPC, but let's say you did. Let's say your budget was even a hundred dollars a day. You're now let's just say say if it actually spends across each keyword, you're not limiting yourself to one click a yeah. keyword. There's no way that you're gonna amount the accumulate the amount of volume and mass that you need to push yourself forward to get to page one by doing that. So if you would take five to ten keywords at a dollar click. You're going to start getting 20 clicks a day on these five keywords, and you're going to get a lot more momentum going there. So I think that's like people want to hit all the targets, be all things to all people. You can't do that. That's it's not possible. So I'd say focus on what you really want to target, but really push the volume that you need to in there. And as long as you're, we talked about this before, but um, but you know before we started recording, but what are the tertiary or what are the secondary metrics that you can look at to tell you? My ROAS has not increased, but I know I'm making progress. Tracking placement in search is one of those things. Is my, my BSR in my subcategory, even in my, my higher category, are those things, is my ranking changing? If yeah. you're seeing that stuff change, uh, and maybe you're even seeing some of your total sales start to increase, if you're tracking those additional things, then that's a good sign that you're making progress and you need to keep spending. But the people that can put their foot on the gas and stay committed, those are the ones that long term they actually can pay less because one they're already high in search so they don't have to spend as much in ads to get there it's kind of an, an initial thing but when they are there they're able to bid back on some of those terms i mean the the market's going to limit it to a certain point but you can bid back and say okay you know i've spent 2 bucks on this keyword for the past 6 months i only want to spend a dollar 75 and you're going to eventually hit a limit but you're going to be able to um, you know get a little bit more bang for your buck in that that yeah. that circumstance. So I mean, that was one person who was already on Amazon, and, and they needed to make some some major tweaks. But once you made those tweaks, uh, they saw a lot better uh, performance and acceleration of stuff. But you had to get through the oh, this kind of hurts right now. We we're not you know we're, we're not seeing an, an, an increase in efficiency yet. Um, yeah, but you got to hold on. Yeah, I think with the advertising aspect, I mean, there's been so much you know learnings I think that everybody's gone through over the last few years. Um, if you go back in the day, back in like 2017, 2018, when all of these PPC courses came out, everybody was like, hey, light up your auto campaigns, light up all these broad campaigns, and then use these to kind of pan for gold, right? And then take the good keywords and filter them over into exact campaigns. Going back to what you talked about, the biggest change that we have seen in terms of better success with our advertising is we actually roll out single keyword campaigns. And the reason why we do this is because we now have granular, uh, you know, ability to be able to actually pull certain levers. So if we notice we're losing ranking on a specific keyword, I can bump up the, the bids and the campaign budget for that specific keyword. In addition to that, Amazon provides you a relevancy or an overall performance score for each of your campaigns. So if you have a low performing keyword, you can just turn off that entire campaign and it's not damaging all the other campaigns as well. So I think to your extent, I mean, we could have a whole conversation on PPC in and of itself. But I am curious to move into your next case study that you have here um, with another brand that came to you. They wanted to scale their business on Amazon. What were some of the strategies that you implemented with this other case study to help them grow? So this brand uh, was in like industrial medical supply area uh, and they were not on Amazon. They wanted to be. And we really had to, they had products, but they didn't have a strong brand um, or really much of a brand. And so we started with, uh, a, a design of the brand. I mean, like creation of uh, a logo or, or an iteration on a logo, a design aesthetic. Looked at the, we said, you know, hey, they've got hundreds of products. Like, let's focus on 10. We don't need to do, we don't need to do more than that. We want to build um, from these 10 eventually, but we wanted to build a base. And we knew that 
advertising funds weren't unlimited. And if you've just like we talked about, you know, limiting from a keyword perspective, if you're trying to spend, you know, 10,000 bucks a month on a hundred items, you're going to get a lot less momentum than you would across 10. So built out the, the brand brand story who we were going after we're like, you know, it could be consumer, it could be professionals. So we thought about who are we really wanting to target here? Uh, got a conclusion there and just really started building out high quality creative. And the creative has changed a lot over the past, even just past couple of years. And the reason there's been so many changes, I think is just because of how consumers interact with Amazon. They're making such quick purchase decisions. They're not spending... I mean, it, it's going to depend upon the category. I think everything in Amazon is category dependent. I have a buddy, he and I, uh, he's in the space and we go back and forth with voice notes. And he was mentioning something to me recently. And I was like, yeah, but it's going to depend upon the category. Like that's always what we do in beauty is going to be different than apparel, uh, different than arts and crafts, different than office supply. And we have to take that in consideration. But we just started developing really good quality assets because people are making quick purchase decisions. 50% of people purchase in 15 minutes or less on Amazon, 28% purchase in three minutes or less. So you have to show product usage. I mean, you have to have you know Amazon standard first product photo, but you have to show uh, on, a, you know, on a white background. You have to show the product in use and you have to give some good text overlay because I don't think people are even reading bullet points anymore. They still matter from an SEO perspective, but if you're making a purchase decision in three minutes or less, if 70 to 80% of people are purchasing on mobile phones, the biggest section that's popping up are the media assets. I think title, reviews, and price point are all important as well. But the media assets are what are really selling that product. If someone can oh. easily flip through multiple pictures that tell them why they should purchase. So if you have, uh, you know, IB, if you're selling ibuprofen, uh, you don't just say 500 milligrams of ibuprofen or what, you know, whatever the main ingredient is. I think that's what it would be. But you don't just say that. It's what is the end result? Like, you know, cures your, you can't say this on Amazon, but gets rid of your headache in an hour. Okay. Now I know that I don't just get rid of my headache, but I get rid of it fast. Yeah. You've overcome my objections and now I want to, I want to, you know, press add to cart or press buy now. So it's giving people the reasons really quickly ahead of time so that they know and they're clear. And I think if someone doesn't want to purchase your product, you're getting to that yes or that no quicker. I mean, that's a sales thing. Get to yes quickly, get to no quickly, get to maybe quickly, like get to the point, but get to it uh, as quickly as possible. And so if someone doesn't want to purchase, they go back out and purchase something else. And that's probably a better user experience, I think, from an Amazon perspective. But ultimately, tell people why they should purchase your product. And we created good quality imagery there. And then we talked about advertising. We said, it's not going to be a good return right away. We're not expecting that. We wanted to... There's always going to be bad stuff that happens with Amazon. So we want to brace people to, to be braced for that. We have a very hopeful outlook, but we want to be realistic in our perspective. So we said, okay, we're going to launch. We're going to, you know put forward like, let's say 5,000 bucks on ad spend, but we're going to stay consistent there no matter what the results, uh, whatever the initial results are. And so we built out these 10 product pages. We got, you know, campaigns started the, the, just in the first couple months, first three months, they spent five grand on ads. Their return was about 0.76 and total sales was a little under five grand. So if you just took that first month, you'd think this was a huge failure. Okay. Second month we spent, we spent five grand again. We saw an increase in ROAS by about like to like 1.1 and total sales doubled. Went up to about like eight plus. Previously, it had been like maybe four or something. So a little under five, but doubled. So we knew we were making progress. The third month, sales doubled again. The ROAS jumped to like two, three, two, 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 three, or somewhere between two, two to two, five um, and spent about five, six grand on advertising. So if you, and, and this, that I think is a really, easy launch. It could be significantly harder if you're in like beauty. I would intentionally run a really low ROAS on those campaigns. I mean, if I had unlimited budget, it, I could probably get away with you know having a higher ROAS, but you have to get those initial impressions, get those clicks so you can start getting the conversions. If you're not even in the conversation, you're not going to be there at all. So you have to be willing to spend. But as you accumulate, you can also start to refine and say, hey, we don't want to spend on this anymore because that's not going to work. So we yeah. stayed consistent there, uh, saw great growth. Uh, they unfortunately ran into some supply issues. And so that cut them off a little bit, but we've continued to um, 
to grow them, uh, still spending about the same amount on advertising. And I mean, that's why I think you, when you hire someone or you bring someone on, really leaning into that advice is important. Because if you bring someone, I mean, I've worked with clients in the past where we said, we need to do this. I'm like, oh, we don't want to do that. I'm like, well, then why did you, <laughs> why did you hire us? I mean, you're, you're paying us money. And, and when people talk a lot about adding value, when you hire an agency, you are not adding value to your business. Here's what I think an agency does if, if they're good at what they do. When you, when you hire someone like Cartology, or even when you hire yourself, you are helping those people uncover value that's already inherent in their business and helping them turn it into revenue. They're actually going out of pocket a lot of times to pay for services, but we're, they're doing it because we can help you turn that pile of rocks and rubble. We can polish it up and turn it into diamonds or turn it into gold for you. Um, but you have to be willing to, to take that advice. And, and it's, not, it's not an easy process and not everyone's ready to, to bite the bullet there. Yeah. I, I love those examples, Michael. I think those case studies are so tangible. And I think uh, the listeners can pick apart, you know, points where they're weak in, whether it be the creative, whether it be in advertising, whether it be, you know, staying the steady course. Um, and I think your wealth of knowledge, um, you know, I think we're all better for it. As we begin to wrap up here, Michael, um, I like to leave the audience with three actionable takeaways from each episode. Here are the three takeaways that I've noted as actionable strategies that people can implement. But Michael, I would love to hear if you think I'm missing something. So number one, one of the things that you talked about at the beginning was product reviews and caring about the customer's experience. That was one of the mistakes that you had made earlier on in your journey. And we talked about how significant going from a 3.5 star rating to a four star from a four star to a 4.5 star rating can have on your product. And so my recommendation and advice for everybody is to actually dive in and dissect the product reviews that you are getting. And although some people can, you know, give outlandish reasons as to why your product didn't work, listen to the customer. And I think one of the most important things is that if you see something going in the wrong direction, you know, make sure that you get in touch with your manufacturer. You correct those things as soon as possible. If that even means you've got to ship out all of that inventory that just went in, that will be more important than trying to sell through a thousand units that are defective. Sure, you can make your money back, but it is not going to benefit your business in the long term if you now move from a 4.5 star down to a four star. It will have a long, a more negative long-term impact on your business than that cash flow um, would have had for you. So that's actually don't take the normal. reviews personally. <laughs> yes, yeah, you have I, to I, I get it. The it's emotional it's easy to remove the emotional component. Like, how can I make this better so that people can actually enjoy more? And then you're going to feel better about that. But if you take it personally, it's going to be really hard to to be open to that feedback. Yeah, uh, one hundred percent agree. Action item number two here is going with the creative content that you talked about. People aren't reading the bullets. People aren't reading the, your description either. The only thing people may read is maybe the beginning of your product title. OK, so what are people doing? They're glancing real quickly through all of your photos. And so here's the key part. It's not just about creating a bunch of lifestyle images, although that is important. It's being able to convey the solution and the ideal state that that customer is trying to achieve by purchasing the product, right? So if they're, if they're purchasing a yoga mat, right, is it, you know, is it because they don't want to sit on a hard floor? It's more than that, right? It's probably more like they're now go, getting into this yoga lifestyle that's like increase your flexibility, right? And it's like, okay, the mat may not be giving you that increased flexibility, but it's providing that foundation for you, right? So you're appealing to their higher senses and appealing to what it is that they're actually trying to solve. You talked about the ibuprofen example. It's not just ibuprofen that they want. What they really want is to remove their migraine or their headache that they're having right now, right? And it, so it is the gap between their current and future state. You need yeah. to assess what that is and you need to show them what the future state looks like. You said it perfectly right there. So show them visually in lifestyle images and then add those specific captions on there. 
another quick hack. This has been something that was uh, brought on by another seller, but Amazon is actually reading. They've got artificial intelligence and computer intelligence that's reading the text that goes on those images. So if you really want to up your game, include keywords into those that the text that you're displaying on your images because Amazon is crawling that and it can help index you and increase your organic ranking. So factor in those keywords, not only into your bullets and description, but your images as well. That's good. Action item number three is focusing on what is going to move the needle the most in your business. You talked about this as kind of one of the mistakes, um, but you also kind of alluded to this with some of the, the case studies that you shared here. One of the biggest things in order to continue to grow and succeed on Amazon is continuing to bring new products to the marketplace, being less dependent on one or two that are everything in your business, because you may face a suspension of one of those ASINs or they just get de-indexed or whatever issues that happen. And if you're too reliant on one or two ASINs, that puts you in a very vulnerable spot. And so, as you mentioned with the previous case study, you know, instead of bringing all all, you know, thousands of their SKUs, you brought on their top 10 first and then you continue to grow from there. And so my action item for people here is obviously start and continue to double down on those ASINs that are winning. But don't neglect to continue to bring on additional SKUs to continue to grow and support your business. Bringing new products to the market is the lifeline for any Amazon seller. So those are my action items. Michael, you think I'm missing anything here? I think that's good. I, I, I've i added something to, to each one. I think the thing I would add to the last one is just get rid of this. If something's not working, get rid of it. Again, less emotional attachment. It could be, especially if you're not necessarily tied to a specific product. Like I said, if you're a consumer goods brand and this is your product, sometimes you have less flexibility there. Maybe you need to iterate on the recipe if it's food whatever the case might be, but be willing to let stuff go. Cause sometimes that dead weight frees up mental energy. It frees up cash. Um, even if you're potentially, you know, you already have a sunk cost and you're, you're losing a little bit, you're freeing up that cash to go into something else. Um, and we all know space is limited in Amazon. So yes. don't hold on to stuff that's that even if it's like, Hey, I sell a good amount of this, but the reviews are like the rating is like a three, seven. And I've just noticed it's declined over time. I'm spending more on advertising on this. I, I don't know. I, I think it's something that I'm just going to uh, cut loose. And, and Amazon is, is honestly it's a ton of experimentation. I mean, it's controlled yeah. experimentation. But when we launch a campaign with someone, you know, I'm pretty confident of what I think I'm going to see. But there's no way of knowing until, until, we, until we let it loose. So it is an experiment in a way. But you have, to, um, you have to keep a grip on it. It's not just let things go and fly by the seat of your pants. But... Sometimes it's, hey, let's test this grouping because we don't know what's going to happen, but let's divert significant budget to it to see if that's going to um, work. So yeah, the experimentation piece is important and, and maybe service providers don't want people to know that there's some experimentation that's involved, but I think <laughs> you just embrace that and, and are honest yep. with people and I think they'll, they'll trust you a little bit more. Yeah, I love that. All right, Michael, I want to dive into my final three questions that I love to ask every guest. Number one is what's been the most influential book that you've read and why? Well, I, I have one that's like more personal life, um, but I also have one that I've read recently that's been really helpful for my business. So um, if I look at those two books, I'm kind of, I'm kind of obfuscating the question here, but um, there is a devotional that I read every day called My Utmost for His Highest, and it challenges me. And I think that's one of the things that I've learned as an entrepreneur is like, I need to find people, coaches, whatever the case might be that challenge me. And maybe I, I am solidified in what I'm doing and it's, and it's right, but maybe something helps me to change my perspective and my mind. Um, and that's something that challenges me every day and I get something from it every day and it helps me to kind of stay centered and in the right um, mindset and the right frame of mind. The other book that I will say, and I've got a, a, a couple books here uh, on my, on my um, desk, but it's this book right here, Gap Selling mm. um, by a guy named Keenan. And it has really changed I've done a lot of work on sales process, but it's really changed how I approach that as an agency. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I can't, I cannot recommend it enough. They've got uh, additional content. They've got a trainer. If you want to work with a trainer, um, I went ahead and did that. 
Uh, and I've just seen a huge improvement in my ability to like assess problems, see, can I, you know, can I fix this or help, uh, you know, with this business problem uh, and, and then actually, you know, win business from it. I love that. Great recommendations. Question number two here is what is a productivity or software tool that you've recently been using that you feel like is a game changer? Well, hmm. I, I would say most recently I have started I've always used Zapier in some capacity, but I've been leveraging the connections because we all have got multiple softwares. Nutshell is my CRM, and I've been attaching that to ClickUp, which is you know another productivity software. But connecting those two things when I create a lead inside of Nutshell, and now automatically creates a card. Excuse me, automatically creates a, a, a card or a task inside of ClickUp, so that it can move through as it moves through the sales process. Uh, it will automatically do that. So that's been super helpful. And I'm now, I was actually, before we even got on this, I was like, okay, how do I create a folder inside of Google Drive when this is open? Like, how are these different things putting together when I, for my podcast, as soon as someone schedules on Calendly, Zapier automatically puts a new session in Squadcast and schedules a new calendar invite for them. That used to be something my assistant have to do. So that's been a huge game changer. It takes time to, to figure it out. And I'm not necessarily the most um, adept at it. But when you can figure something out, it feels like a huge win and it saves you. It's that first order negative, second order positive. I'm going to spend three hours trying to figure out how to set this up, but I'm going to save myself a ton of time in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Zapier is awesome. We've recently started using make.com um, and that's a, another version of Zapier, but it okay. actually creates like entire flows. It's a little more complicated to get set up, but once you get it set up, you could actually walk through an entire like SOP um, and visually see it. Um, it's a little M-A-K-E. Yep. M-A-K-E. Make. I'm going to have to check com. that out, man. Check I it out. That. All right. Final question. Who is somebody that you admire or respect the most in the e-commerce space that other people should be following and why? I mean, I was going to jokingly say, can I say myself? But that would have sounded <laughs> so, so pompous. Totally <laughs> kidding. Um, someone that I really look up to and, and have gotten really uh, close with uh, is a buddy of mine. His name's Brett Bohannon. And he's been in the Amazon space for a while. He started as a seller as well and uh, has done work for a lot of brands, agencies, been, I think, behind the scenes in a lot of stuff that people maybe would know about, um, but maybe not necessarily know him. And he has a this really cool cohort of learning called Amazon with Brett. And uh, he's recently started calling himself the Amazon Cowboy. Let's see if he's still doing that when this podcast comes out. <laughs> but he and I do a, a, an AMA once a month on, uh, on Twitter uh, and it goes live on like LinkedIn and, and YouTube. But we, it's like, ask us anything about Amazon. Um, he's super knowledgeable. He's got a lot of great practical experience, like dealing with flat files and stuff. And this Amazon with Brett, Amazon with Brett .com, uh, He doesn't just put together course information, but it is a live learning cohort. So I've had people on my team go and, and be in this learning cohort to talk about what are problems we're facing, all this kind of stuff. And I think that is a real, not just taking a course and being in, in a power group, but talking with real people actually facing problems. And I know I've seen brands, I've seen people that work at agencies, anyone can, can get something from, uh, from this. And he's, he's just a good, he's a good dude and he's funny too. So yeah, Brett, Brett awesome. Bohannon for sure. Awesome. Very fun. Well, thank you for sharing all of your wisdom with us today, Michael. If people want to learn more about you and your agency, want to consider working with you, where's the best people that people, where's the best place that people can reach out to you at? You can, man, you can email me directly if you want. Michael at thinkcartology.com. If you need help with Amazon, think, think cartology, cartology.com is not available, unfortunately. I've tried, I've tried to acquire it, but you can email me directly. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's like LinkedIn forward slash in forward slash I'm Michael Marr. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Michael J. Marr, Instagram, Michael Joseph Marr. But any of those places uh, are good. Feel free to reach out and, and um, or just go to our website, thinkcartology.com and, and find out more there. Awesome. And we'll link everything in the show notes as well to make it easy for people. Um, Beautiful. Michael, thank you so much for your time and sharing your wisdom with us. I know I'm much better for it. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks for, thanks for listening. And uh, thanks for doing such a good job of introducing me and, and summarizing things. I, I told you I need to hire you just to bring me around on calls so you can do good intros. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for having me, man. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was, it's good to 
to talk this stuff out with, with someone else that's, that's knowledgeable. Awesome. Thanks again, Michael. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.